Hello friends, a very warm welcome to all of you from sunny Montreal. It is indeed an honor for me to moderate this online press conference from the Convention Center in Montreal, where the world's biggest AIDS conference, the 24th International AIDS Conference or AIDS 2022 is taking place. This press conference is jointly organized by Citizen News Service and the Asian Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women in Malaysia, or ARO, as it is more commonly known as. ARO is a regional feminist organization working on sexual and reproductive health and rights and gender equality across 15 priority countries in the Asia Pacific region. Today happens to be the first day of this five day long conference. And today is also the official online launch of the Hindi version of Arrow's publication titled Climate Justice in Planet A, Grah A Me Jalvayu Nyay, as it translates into Hindi. This publication highlights the prevailing climate justice issues in the Asia Pacific region. More specifically, it builds perspectives on the interlinkages and key issues, including SRHR and bodily autonomy in differential vulnerability to climate change, looks into the status and issues in integration of women, girls, and LGBTI people's needs in climate change action, with a specific focus on health and climate change action. It brings forth the voices of youth and their intergenerational concerns and documents success stories and advocacy strategies that have led to just transitions in the region. The English publication by Arrow has already been there online at www.arrow.org.my. And now after today's launch, you can explore the Hindi translation of it also at the web link given in the chat box. Well, this does deserve a clap from us, doesn't it? As we launch the Hindi publication. So you can see it on the screen. I now invite Sivananthi Thanenthiran, Executive Director of Arrow, to say a few words. Siva has authorized uh, sorry, Siva has authored regional monitoring reports on the progress governments have made towards their commitments to gender equality and sexual and reproductive rights in the region under the Reclaiming and Redefining Rights series published by Arrow. Under her leadership, Arrow has expanded its work to include the intersections of sexual and reproductive rights and critical development issues such as climate change, migration, disabilities. Siva has also successfully positioned Arrow as a champion from the global south on sexual and reproductive rights and sits on the leadership of the Act Action Coalition on Bodily Autonomy and Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights of UN Women, and also on UNFPA's Global Advisory Council. Over to you, Siva. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are and wherever you're joining us from. In this, Arrow and CNS are proud to host the side event on climate change and its effect on sexual and reproductive health and rights. We find that this is a timely session to do together because in these last two years, the world has been thrown into disarray by the COVID-19 pandemic. But simultaneously, slowly, in the background, the effect of climate change on our world has also been unfolding. In these last few years, we have witnessed intense rainfall and ensuing devastating floods across several countries, crippling our systems, causing loss of life, livelihoods and assets, especially amongst the poorer people who are forced to live in these flood prone areas. On the other hand, intense heat has also led to droughts and will eventually lead to crop failure. Yet despite having lived through COVID-19, governments seem still reluctant to make the systemic and institutional shifts required for us to ameliorate the effects of climate change or help communities to be resilient in the face of climate change. How does climate change affect SRHR, you may ask? More importantly, 
What learnings do we have from SRHR, which we can extend to the HIV AIDS community? Disruption of health services and deprioritization of sexual and reproductive health services means that health becomes inaccessible and HIV services such as testing, counseling, access to ARVs, referrals also become disrupted for all living in these flood affected areas. Whether the adaptive measure at community level is walking further for food, water and fuel, girls and boys face increased risk of violence, of which not only pregnancies but STIs such as HIV AIDS increase during this time. Communities affected by floods and drought often have to migrate across boundaries, borders, which often see increase in unsafe sex practices due to inaccessibility of commodities, as well as inability to negotiate sexual boundaries. Moreover, climate change exacerbates the inequities felt by already marginalized communities, such as sex workers, MSM, and transgender persons amongst these. Data shows that during the COVID crisis, most of these groups were not able to access the social security measures offered by governments as they did not fit the required categories. Arizona work on the interlinkages of food security with SRHR showed how LBTI persons especially were vulnerable to food insecurity as they faced persecution and eviction from their own families and communities. The excommunication from community at a young age entails a long period of life being food insecure and malnourished and hungry. Hence, we as empowered and privileged advocates who occupy space need to be able to hold governments accountable to the promises they have made to us on climate change. All of the communities we hold dear to us, young people, women, non-binary persons, LGBTI, these communities will suffer most the effects of climate change and we owe it to them to ensure that we speak as one global community on this issue. All of us will be affected by climate change. This is the reason Arrow and Partners worked on the Arrows for Change edition on climate justice in Planet A. And we feel that it's very timely and strategic to work with CNS in order to pro provide the Hindi translation of this edition. We hope that this work is useful to all of us to guide us on our future advocacy on this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Siva. Thank you for joining us online and focusing on how climate change is impacting HIV care and control amongst so many other things. Our next speaker is Tete Lauren from Philippines, who is an ad advisor for the United Nations program of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, New York office. Tete is a development worker with almost 30 years experience in multidisciplinary and multicultural settings at grassroots, national, regional, and international levels. She's a policy and advocacy expert on diverse issues, including climate justice, sustainable development, financing for development, trade, human rights, gender and women's rights, amongst others. She has served as co-chair in regional and global advocacy platforms and has represented civil society in different advocacy arenas. She has also helped coordinate the Asia Pacific Feminist Forum with the Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law and Development or APWLD. Welcome Tetet. Morning everyone, my name is Tete Tlauron. I'm a climate justice activist based in Manila, Philippines. Thank you very much to Arrow for giving me this opportunity to be part of the 24th International AIDS Conference, talking about the intersections of our struggle for climate justice with the many structural and systemic problems that we are facing. So um, this uh, initiative is part of the uh, Arrow publication last year around um, the status of the climate negotiations and I was very very um, honored to uh, have written the editorial for this publication. So we all know the importance of um, climate negotiations because this is the international community's response to the many challenges uh, 
we are experiencing because of increasing global temperatures, because of the growing and the intense impacts of the climate crisis, especially on vulnerable and marginalized populations. We all know that um, last year there was this um, conference of parties in Glasgow, Scotland. Supposedly, this was framed as the last chance to steer climate action back towards meeting the objectives of keeping global temperature uh, rise in check and also to mobilize international support for climate action. We all know that the climate crisis is impacting progress made towards gender equality, the closing of gender wage gaps, maternal health, and sexual rights because we see that more destructive disasters <coughs> displace women and girls and damage physical infrastructure that cater to their reproductive and sexual health. A lot of studies also made by Arrow show how the climate crisis also increases the incidence of gender-based violence related to the scarcity of natural resources and how women and girls travel farther distances to secure food and water. As a result, feminists and activists worldwide continue to face the challenges of getting these issues resolved in official climate negotiations where business as usual always prevails. So um, I'd like to give you some key messages that we would like to um, highlight you know, as part of the publication, but also as part of our continuing struggle as part of the global justice community. First, of course, is that we must not accept business as usual. We deserve more, not just from the climate negotiations, but we deserve more from the institutions of global governance that supposedly you know, serve and uphold the interests of people and planet. We will, we will continue with the, the next speaker. And I thank Tetet for being there. And now we will be able to read her editorial in Hindi as well. Uh, let us now hear from Fitiria Iskander, a medical doctor and an environment youth activist. She is head of communications at Siangal Indonesia chapter Pontianak, which was established and led by her. It aims to empower youth to take action for a better environment. She is a youth advocate in Youth Voices for Climate Change campaign and is a senior certified climate restoration advocate by Youth Leaders for Climate Restoration. Fitria also leads the Asia Pacific Climate Project that promotes SDGs 12 to 15 and provides an online platform for youth in Asia Pacific to interact and engage on environmental issues. Over to you. Hello everyone, my name is Fitria. I am one of the author of the Intergenerational Justice for the Earth Sustainability, one of the Arrow for Change articles. So um, I wrote this with my colleague, we, Mimi Zino. Um, so basically, I'm going to highlight some of the um, important points that I wrote with my colleague in, the, in this article. So in this article, we divided into three sections. First one to define um, where are we now. So the climate change um, has become a progressive threat to the earth since the industrial revolutions as it burns fossil fuels and release more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere and of course this increased the number of the greenhouse gases compared to pre-industrial revolutions and of course in this situation uh, human activity has warmed the world by around one uh, what, i'm sorry by around 0 0.87 degrees celsius uh, compared to the pre-industrial level and we have threshold number is 1.5 degrees celsius we'll, where if we um, keep the current situation um, going so we will be ex um, exceeding or um, reaching the 1.5 degrees celsius by 2040 or without um, immediate and large scale reduction of greenhouse gas emissions they're limiting the number to the 1.5 degrees Celsius or even 2 degrees Celsius will be, yeah, we can call it impossible. So in the sec second section, um, talking about what if we are too late. So of course, um, in this section, we, are, we want to emphasize how if the situation is already, already too late for um, to go back to, no, um, to go back to um, back point. But 
instead of um, go back to a point where we can solve everything but we are stepping on on the no turn back point that will be the threat and of course the future generation will experience the worst case of the climate scenario because of course they will continue in the life and of course as the future generations um, all of the burden will be keep adding more and this will be impacting their future life and yeah this undesirable climate conditions will also result in depletion of natural resources and um, of course not only depletion on the natural resources but also um, will have a significant societal impact such as like uh, population migration and economic dislocation and wagely costly uh, for future generations and at national level and in this will be like more natural disaster related to climate change will be happened and this will be enforcing the future generations to abandon their home or properties and then yeah clean up polluted areas even though we are doing it right now and even relocate to urban areas and then the last section is about um, youth voices as future generation voices we want to emphasize how um, the youth voices uh, is important here to be involved in any process of um, climate policies or even in the grassroots communities because youth made up for almost um, one third of the global population so it's a big number and especially in the developing countries where the large youth population will be bear the most impact of the climate change and as the current conditions are intensifying over time of course, like I mentioned before, the child and youth today will have the possibility to face the worst of the effects of the climate change in the future. And of course, um, with that situation, we are facing by two options now, prepare them to adapt and mitigate or prevent them uh, the disaster to happen. And yeah, of course, both of the option will be work, um, but the second one, should be more favorable because we know that it's our responsibility to um, to take care about the environment and to prevent it will become worse and of course including youth in all process will be important and we don't need a tokenistic involvement but we need a meaningful youth engagement so as youth are part of the future generations where they are taking responsibility in continuing their future climate restoration effort they should be be heard involved in the decision making and processes and also be empowered in any form of support so that's all um, about the content of the intergenerational justice for the earth sustainability thank you so much thank you very much Petria, and thank you for focusing on the youth and it is actually that together the young and old Together, we can we have to contribute our bit and see how we can mitigate to the earliest the impacts, the severing impacts of climate change. And last but definitely not the least, we have Menka Gondon, a feminist activist and senior program manager at Women's Fund Fiji. Menka has worked in research, advocacy, and training in women's human rights in Fiji and the Pacific. She has previously worked with the Pacific Center for Peace Building and Fiji Women's Rights Movement. She is also a member of the Program Advisory Committee of ARO. Over to you, Menka. Bulofinaka. My name is Menka Gounden, and I work as the Executive Director for the Women's Fund Fiji. I'm also here today as the Program Advisory Committee um, Rep for ARO. Last year, ERA released the Errors for Change publication uh, on climate justice in Planet A. As part of that publication, I contributed a piece on the struggles of the people of the Moana. The people of the Moana, and Moana which means the ocean in many Pacific Island languages, uh, talks about the people of the Pacific. The Pacific is the largest body of ocean in the world. And here in the Pacific, climate change is rampant. In fact, Pacific Island countries have contributed least 
to greenhouse gases, but face the most wrath of climate-induced disasters each year. The most damage to the, e to the ecosystem and to the stratosphere and space is within the zone of the Pacific Ocean that is increasing heat waves and increasing the temperatures rapidly around the Pacific Ocean. This has resulted in sea level rise for many Pacific Island countries. Small Pacific Island countries like Nauru and Tuvalu are at a brink of being fully dispersed or fully immersed rather in the ocean. We heard very painful experiences of Pacific Island uh, countries and Pacific Island people during various COP processes. But there has been still very little done or heard about the women's experiences and girls' experiences and gender non-conforming people's experiences in the Pacific. Pacific women have been um, in the forefront of climate justice since the time of nuclear testing in the Pacific in the early 80s and 90s. Um, Pacific women have led the conversation around climate and environmental justice in the Pacific. We still see, though, that women's experiences are not as highlighted when it comes to climate justice work. We have been systemically subtracted from conversations um, and policy making around climate justice. Many Pacific Island countries are moving towards efforts around climate policies, but are they taking into account women's sentiments and women's lived experience is another question. Although gender equality work has been severely invested in the Pacific, whether these changes are long term given the climate change that we are seeing is also questionable. For example, Women's Fund Fiji works with Neta Siri Women in Dairy, which is a uh, group of women dairy farmers in the highlands of Neta Siri, located in the main island of Viti Levu in Fiji. They are working on a women's economic empowerment project whereby the yield that they will get is from the sale of milk that they will do to the Fiji Dairy Cooperatives Limited. Although currently we are seeing steadily the increase of the milk that they yield and are able to sell to FCDL, this may not be the case in the long term. Because of rising temperatures, pastures may not be as available to these women dairy farmers as they are right now. Warming climate also means l lower levels of lactation for cows. So in the future, say in the next 20 to 25 years, we will rapidly, we will gradually rather see a decrease of yield of milk. So this development that we are doing, a women's economic empowerment project that we are doing with Nature City Women in Dairy, is its sustainability and the profit that the women are making is in question because of climate-induced calamities that we have in the Pacific at the moment. The other is we are also working with Women in Fisheries Network. It's a network of women fisher folks and women who are invested in aquaculture and maritime culture. So it, fish stocks are declining because of the increase in temperatures of seawater or also because of the changes in the patterns of climate, um, warmer sea levels, higher sea surges, um, swell erosion um, and also uh, lack of uh, coral um, cultivation etc because of warmer sea levels, bleaching of coral because of warmer sea levels is uh, impacting the way the sea ecosystem, the marine ecosystem is behaving and affecting fish and livelihood stocks. So for these women as well who are invested in this particular sector, it, climate change is also an alarming issue and is a livelihoods issue for them. So no matter how much of marine protected environment or marine protected programs that we have 
or livelihood fish stock, fish stock rather programs that we have, in the long run, because of the climate-induced disasters that is beyond the control of Pacific Island countries, is going to impact the work that these women are trying to do as part of the Women in Fisheries Network. Now that's speaking on the long term, in terms of sustainability and in terms of economics around uh, climate-induced disasters. Let's speak shorter term, in terms of the rampant climate-induced disasters that we are seeing in the Pacific. Climate events like tropical cyclones have become more, uh, it have increased in frequency and have also increased in intensity in the past five years. We have seen Cyclone Pam, Cyclone uh, Winston, Yasa, who have done a lot of damage to Pacific Island countries like Vanuatu and Fiji. During these, we have not only seen millions of dollars worth of infrastructure damage, but also damage to the economy. There has been also damage to the way people live. For example, fund, the Women's Fund Fiji's grantee partner, Rise Beyond the Reef, post-tropical cyclone Yasa in 2020, in the height of COVID-19, by the way, was um, working with the community in the second large island, Vanualevu, in the province of Bua called Dongea village. They helped them construct homes uh, of the homes that, that were destroyed during the tropical cyclone Yasa. So during this period, it was realized that the current grounds that their village is constructed on may not be sustainable for future disasters. Now we're hearing in 2022 that the village is earmarked for moving by the Fijian government. When a village or a settlement moves, there is a, a great pressure on women and girls. Women are traditionally seen as food gatherers and as providers uh, of care to the family. So if you're moving, you're moving away from your traditional food sources, from your traditional water sources, um, and also your traditional farm sources and, and spaces of living and livelihoods. So for women to move and adjust in a new place may mean a whole deal of different level of living. We've also heard this from um, a community called Vunindongaloa, which has been the first community in the world to relocate because of climate change and climate in these disasters. Um, recently, Women in Fisheries Network has started working with the women of Vunindongaloa uh, in terms of the way that they're living and how they're living around uh, the community and what the moving has meant for them. They've now settled in their new um, area that they have uh, uphill, which where they are now living, away from the coastal village that they were, um, and the only way of life that they've known their entire lives and for generations was around coasts. Now they are uphill, so for them, the entire structure of living has changed. So for women who used to probably go to the ocean and fish, and gather food around the coast, now means that now they have to learn about agriculture and about food, food source practices around a, around a forest in a more mountainous area. This is a whole block of adjustment that the women are making. These women previously were part of the Women in Fisheries Network because they were earning from the coast around them. Living uphill means that now they have to come down and spend time, invest time in travel coming and going from the coastal area um, so that they're able to access their uh, livelihood source, which is the ocean. So even moving people is not as simple as we think it is. And it doesn't really solve prob uh, a whole lot of problems. In fact, it creates a new level of problems for these communities. Whilst we're speaking about all this, the simple thing in this is that the Pacific continues to be the smallest contributor to greenhouse gases in the world. Through all these global uh, interactions that we're having, like the COP meetings, are we still making any great impact on the lives of those who are living in the community and grassroots level, those that are actually impacted by climate change? There 
entire livelihoods, their ancestral um, knowledge, etc., are being lost through climate change. How are we mitigating those? Are we, how are we controlling the loss and damage that is being done by climate change in the Pacific region? Um, how are we compensating? Not that there is any compensation to losing traditional burial grounds or to losing traditional knowledge or even connection with your own land, but how is that being done to Pacific Island people, particularly to women and girls? Because we live in a patriarchal society. So how is that loss and damage being also um, talked about from the analysis and perspective of women and girls? Um, we, this also poses a whole range of SRHR issues as well. Access to clean, safe water sources, um, access to quality health care. If we are moving settlements in inland for communities and for countries like Fiji, whose road infrastructure is mainly focused on coastal areas or around the coastal areas, what does moving communities inland away from the coast mean? Are they being cut off from vital access to services, like for pregnant women accessing um, health care, or divisional hospitals for that instance, for girls accessing school? So these are also things at play that we oftentimes do not consider when we talk about this uh, climate displaced peoples or climate induced migration. So that is some of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, um, which you can read further information about in the um, Protecting the Moana piece, um, written on the Arrows for Change publication. Uh, also, the Women's Fund Fiji website provides uh, blogs that have also examples of lived experience of women and girls in and around Fiji, um, and also, just wishing that you know we're able to raise our voices as women and girls of the Moana to um, increase our lobby and advocacy efforts around how we are talking about loss and damage for women and girls around the Pacific on climate change. Vinaka Vakalevu, Dhanewad, and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Menka. And thank you for voicing the stories of women and the agony and pain of the Fiji women or the women of Moana is shared by women, I think, in all corners of the world, especially in the Asia Pacific region. Thank you very much. Uh, I now invite the participants to please type in your comments or questions in the chat box. In fact, we already have a few comments there. So I will just read out uh, for the benefit of everyone else because this is being streamed live on Facebook also. Uh, Nahit Khalid says uh, that uh, it is true uh, what Siva had mentioned earlier that and during times of COVID, antiretroviral supply was so difficult uh, due to the lockdown. And Nahid is also worried that enough women and girls who face the problems due to climate extreme events are actually not involved to that extent in decision making on climate. And unless, and she's right there, and unless they are involved and their voices are heard, as Arrow and organizations like CNS are trying to do, I, I don't think we will be able to really overcome those impacts. Uh, Brian from Star Kenya says that the LGBTI communities are always hugely marginalized, especially in Africa. And Brian wants to know that the, is the story which Menka is sharing available in the publication? Yes, Brian, all these stories which are mentioned, they are real stories and they are there in the publication. Uh, Diana Wang says, even without climate event, gender inequalities impact girls and women and LGBTI people and indigenous people. But climate events like flood devastate infrastructure, so health, plus other services are disrupted, supply chains are broken down, village homes near rivers all gone, long-term devastation. Yes, that, that is the reality, that is the sad reality. Uh, and uh, uh, Diana also thanks that uh, for this work and says that climate and gender link 
is indeed very important. Uh, let me see if we have, uh, you have the links uh, there in the chat box. And uh, if you want the Hindi publication to be mailed hard copy to you within India, then you can email your details. I have given my email ID. I have put it in the chat box. And uh, with this, I think we wind up this press conference. Speakers and the participants for being with us here today, even though online. As mentioned earlier, the web link to the publication will be disseminated to all those of you who are based in, uh, will be uh, available to, uh, will be disseminated to all participants. While the soft copy is available to all, those of you who are based in India and would like to have a hard copy, as has been mentioned in the chat box. Uh, if you want the hard copy of the Hindi version, please drop me an email at my email ID and let me know your postal mailing address and we will get the copy delivered to you. And for any other further information, please be welcome to contact me by email. And here is wishing all of us that we get to see a feminist fossil fuel free future in our lives. I strongly believe in this because only a feminist response that is based on sharing and caring can lead us to a world where everyone, irrespective of their caste, creed, or sexual orientation can have a dignified and respectful existence. Goodbye and namaste. Stay safe and stay healthy.